Good evening, everyone. Encouraged by your presence here, your willingness to study more from God's Word. Uh, As has been already said, we've had a great series of lessons so far. Uh, Hoping to continue that this evening with the study of Zedekiah, who's going to be the last king of Judah. Didn't have the scripture reading, so I'm going to go ahead and do that real quickly. Um, If you turn over to Jeremiah with me. Jeremiah. Chapter 21, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. It's a lengthier reading I was hoping someone else was going to do, but I'll be doing that. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him to pasture, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, and the king may go away from us. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of great pestilence. And afterward, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people, and such are left in this city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them or have pity or mercy. Now you shall say to this people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be as a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given to the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. So from the beginning, we kind of know the end here. We are talking about, once again, Zedekiah, this last king of Judah. Um, Another, before the beginning starts, we know the end here. In Second Chronicles, we read a very unflattering summary of the life of Zedekiah, in which he's remembered as being a stiff-necked, hard-hearted rebel. Second Chronicles 36, 11-13, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. His God did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke the word of the Lord, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. So for this lesson, we will be examining Zedekiah, this last king of Judah. We'll be looking at some historical background to kind of start out here, the time which Zedekiah lived and gain an understanding of the state of his kingdom by the time he came to power. We'll briefly explore his predecessors as well, again, to provide some context for what he was coming into. As we recount the major life events of Zedekiah as recorded by Scripture, we're also going to analyze his character. And finally, we're going to conclude by looking at some lessons that we can learn from Zedekiah. So we'll start, as we said, with the historical background. Um, some biblical context here. we kind of got to skip around a little bit to find about Zedekiah here. His story is told in 2 Kings uh, chapters 24 and 20, or 25, 2 Chronicles 36, and the entirety of the book of Jeremiah, a lot of it deals with uh, Zedekiah and his reign as Jeremiah was a prophet during the time of uh, Zedekiah. The account in 2 Kings give a broad historical outline of the events of Zedekiah's reign, while the 2 Chronicles account supplies some additional details. The account recorded in Jeremiah gives some of the -the behind-the-scenes information, uh, most notably the the spiritual component of Zedekiah's Zedekiah's struggles. I think one of my points popped up there a little soon. That's all right. The northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to Assyria about 130 years prior, but the kingdom of Judah had remained. Uh, Zedekiah's time is going to be around after the, after the fall of the Assyrian Empire and during the time of great conflict between Egypt and this ever-expanding Neo-Babylonian Empire. This is also called the Chaldean Empire. You heard a reference made to the Chaldeans uh, in the scripture reading there, uh, or, the, or the second Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar II. So here we got our, our map we can kind of look at here and, and kind of get an idea of where things are happening. Uh, as Michael pointed out, Michael Ray pointed out, we got right here a uh, tiny little Israel, Jerusalem right here where most of our stories are going to be taking place. And then all this is the Babylonian Empire. Um, And again, we're going to kind of fall on here uh, somewhere along the way. Uh, Egypt's down here. They kind of play a role in this story that we're going to see. 
And, and once again, just all of Babylon here. Keep in mind the whole time that we're going through this, just the size of Babylon where it stretches, uh, you know, all of its borders here. Continuing on, uh, we've got Zedekiah coming into the, the, the story here. He's going to be the 20th and final king of Judah before the conquest of the kingdom by Nebuchadnezzar II, who we're going to just refer to going forward as just simply Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Zedekiah would be king for 11 years. That's going to be from 597 B.C. to 586 B.C. Again, it's good to have an understanding of uh, where we are, I guess, and, and talk about Zedekiah's predecessors to understand, I guess, the context, again, of what he's fallen into as he comes, becomes king in this, in this time period here. So, first of all, we got King Josiah, who a lot of us uh, have some understanding of who he was. He would reign for 31 years, uh, 640 to 609 B.C. This is Zedekiah's father. Uh, this was a righteous man that we were talking about here. King, good King Josiah, we often call him. Uh, famously became king at eight years old. Uh, it says in 2 Kings 22, 1 through 2, that he did right in the sight of the Lord, uh, following in David's footsteps there. Of course, after the book of the law was recovered, he would establish these religious reforms throughout the kingdom. He would work to purge the kingdom of idol worship and restore the temple. Unfortunately, he would die in battle uh, in e against Egypt. Continuing on, we got King Jehoahaz, who would reign for three months in 609 B.C. Not a very long reign there. This was Zedekiah's brother. Uh, he would reign only three months, during which time he did evil in the sight of the Lord, a phrase that was commonly applied to many of his own predecessors and, and many of the, or those who would follow him as well. He was removed from the throne and exiled to Egypt, where he would later die. Then we got King Jehoiakim, who would reign for 11 years. 609 to 597 B.C., this is Zedekiah's half-brother. He was chosen by the Egyptians as a vassal king to pay them tribute, and as a result, he would unfairly tax the people and be a great burden to them. Uh, he was captured by invading forces along with noble families. This is including uh, Daniel. Uh, we know about him as about students of the Bible. But he was sent back as a vassal king himself, this time to Babylon. Uh, this was a very wicked king that we're talking about here with Jehoiakim. He was actively opposed to God's word. Uh, notably, he burnt a scroll. And this scroll is kind of interesting in the context of this lesson because it prophesied the destruction of Judah at the hand of a people from the north. I wonder if that's going to come back around at, at some point here. Going on, we know that he also would shed much innocent blood, including that of the prophet Uriah, and among other atrocities that he would be involved in. He himself would later rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, resulting in Jerusalem's besiegement and his own ignoble death. And finally, we got King Jehoiachin, not to be confused with Jehoiakim there. Uh, he would reign for three months as well. This is in 597 B.C. Uh, this is Jehoiakim's son. This is Zedekiah's nephew. It's kind of interesting that uh, Zedekiah was kind of zigzagged there in the, in the process of, of, of the reigning uh, leaders here that we see. Uh, he continued his father's rebellion, Jehoiakim did, rebelling against the Babylonians, but he was forced to surrender after only three months. He was taken as a hostage, among with other political leaders, craftsmen, educated people, and many of the Levites, including Ezekiel, and the first major deportation of Judah into Babylon. And that's going to enter the scene on Zedekiah here. His reign is going to begin. Uh, we see here in 2 Kings 24, 17, the king of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar here, made Mataniah, Jehoiakim, Chin's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Twenty-one years old, when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar installed him on the throne of Judah. As we read here, his birth name was Mataniah, which means gift of God. However, he would be renamed by Nebuchadnezzar. This renaming of a subservient king was a way to demonstrate authority over him, uh, a way of saying Nebuchadnezzar essentially owned Zedekiah. He owned Judah here. By putting, his, by putting his own stamp on his name. Furthermore, Nebuchadnezzar made Zedekiah swear an oath of loyalty to him. This is swore in God's name, which is something that's going to come back up later on as well. The intention was that Zedekiah would rule as a sort of puppet king, again, a vassal king, as we've seen with a couple of these kings in a row here, uh, serving the interests of Babylon. Meanwhile, the kingdom of Judah, once again, falling into that old practice of idol worship that they just kept going in this cycle of falling into idol worship over and over again uh, after, prior to Josiah and, and following him as well. Uh, this is thanks to, again, Zedekiah's wicked brothers we just talked about not that long ago. The prophet Jeremiah urged Zedekiah to return to the Lord just time and time again. Uh, Zedekiah himself, an idol worshiper, apparently did nothing to course correct Judah spiritually. Oh, I guess that point was supposed to be up there. Now it's up there. Continuing on, 
if we had kingly uh, titles uh, here along the way, one of Zedekiah's would be Zedekiah the Unfaithful. Uh, we've read a portion of this passage already, but we're going to kind of uh, continue this here. Second Chronicles 36, starting in the latter part of the 13th verse and continue on to verse 14. It says, He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers and the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he made holy in Jerusalem. So we see here that Zedekiah proved to be unfaithful in his dealings. Uh, first of all, he was unfaithful with Nebuchadnezzar in, in Babylon here. We have these envoys that, from Egypt that are going to come to Zedekiah and attempt to convince him to break his oath. Again, remember, this is an oath made to God, to rebel against Babylon. Pharaoh pledged to send his army in support of Judah. Together, they thought that they could defeat this Nebuchadnezzar. Again, think back to the big map we looked at earlier as we, uh, as we started this lesson. Zedekiah's court advisors were in favor of rebelling against Babylon. Uh, we had a false prophet in Hananiah who said that God broke the yoke of Babylon. Uh, I think there was some threatening that was happening here. They would overthrow Zedekiah if he wasn't going to go along with this plan. So Zedekiah is faced with this temptation to break his oath of loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar, to please his advisors, and to put his trust in the might of Egypt, we see. We see also that Zedekiah was unfaithful to Jeremiah. During this time, nine years, the prophet Jeremiah would warn Zedekiah time and time again about the state of his nation, uh, including an incident involving a bunch of uh, yokes there along the way that you can read about. Um, he told Zedekiah that the Lord was displeased with the state of the kingdom, with Judah's idolatrous practices, idolatrous practices, and that ruin would come into the kingdom if he continued to ignore the will of the true God. Jeremiah also counseled Zedekiah against rebelling. Though Babylon was a wicked nation, Jeremiah told Zedekiah that he should honor his oath, remain loyal to Nebuchadnezzar, and continue to pay tribute to him. Jeremiah said that God would establish Zedekiah if he heeded his warnings, and if he only he would obey God in the process. And that's where we come to this last point here, Zedekiah proved to be unfaithful in his dealings with God, ultimately. It was God to whom Zedekiah was most unfaithful. Zedekiah would not listen to Jeremiah's calls for repentance. He did nothing to rid Judah of idol worship. In fact, it seems Zedekiah almost doubled down on his wickedness and joined in with others in the defiling of the temple. Meanwhile, on the political front, Zedekiah resisted this temptation to rebel against Babylon for nine whole years. However, when he refused to listen to the Lord speaking to Jeremiah concerning these political affairs, through fear possibly selfless ambition. I don't know. Again, I think about without God's help here, the, the, the tiny Judah and, and this Egyptian army we're going to talk about a little bit later, thinking they could take on Babylon here. Whatever, the, whatever it was, Zedekiah sought to please his wicked advisors rather than to serve God. So due to his unfaithfulness, we see that Zedekiah ultimately decided to rebel. And in doing so, he set in motion this tragic series of events that would condemn his people to great suffering, set himself up for tremendous personal loss, and in due time would result in the end of the kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah 37, 1 through 2. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord. He spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. We see here that Zedekiah was unsure of where to turn during these times of trial. In the historical, I guess, events that are going to occur here, we have the siege of Jerusalem starting. Um, I guess Zedekiah's advisors had assured him that the Babylonians are not going to come. Again, maybe I don't know what the thought process was here, that we're going to rebel. This tiny little kingdom is going to rebel against Babylon. They're not going to do anything about it here along the way. And yet Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he swiftly mobilizes forces towards Jerusalem and arrives in less than a month's time. The Babylonian army sets up camp in defensive position, setting in for a long besiegement. And if you're not familiar with what besiegement is, uh, I found out at Vault Ridge, as I was talking about this, I did a, I did a warm-up lesson over there. I kind of cheated a little bit. But I showed this picture over here, and we got all this army around the city here, and they're actively attacking it. But a lot of times, besiegement is really just kind of a waiting game. Uh, the army will show up and kind of surround the city, and they'll just let kind of time do the work for them. Uh, they might uh, do these little minor attacks, and those kind of finds the thing, find weak points. But really, they let starvation do the job uh, of what they would normally do in the, in the killing and attacking here. So maybe this isn't the best one, because that's more, more of like an action photo we have going on there in this case, or an action painting, not a photo uh, there. So we see the Babylonian camp. They set up these, uh, the Babylonian army set up camps in defensive positions. Again, it's for this long besiegement. 
So now we have the city of Jerusalem surrounded by a force of thousands. Zedekiah considers his own pitiful army. All that's left at this point is the garrison of Jerusalem. It's all that's going to be inside the city here. Other cities have kind of fallen in the, along the way as uh, the army kind of arrives. So he's starting to feel hopeless. Zedekiah only then summons Jeremiah and asks the prophet to pray for him and his people. Uh, I'm not sure if this is where the prophecy of the scripture reading kind of falls in here. The timeline's kind of fuzzy. Like I said, we go back and forth between Jeremiah, 2 Kings, and Chronicles. And sometimes it's hard to tell where these uh, different events kind of fall into place here. But again, the messengers echo time and time again that you need to repent. You need to submit to Babylon. You need to turn to God, ultimately being the idea that Jeremiah is trying to communicate to Zedekiah, and he ignores it over and over again. So this besiegement begins, and Egyptian army begins to arrive. Uh, meanwhile, Pharaoh and his forces are going to march to attack Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians broke their siege, took a little break here to go and fight off the Egyptians. Zedekiah thought that Pharaoh was their deliverer, and his advisors may have congratulated themselves, thinking, oh yeah, here comes Egypt, they've, they've, held, they've you know, held it there into the bargain, and now we're going to see this great battle happen, we're going to be saved here. But again, Jeremiah foretells disaster. He reminded Zedekiah that it was God himself who opposed Judah for their sins. Jeremiah prophesied that Jerusalem would be destroyed and told the king and his court that their only hope, once again, was repentance. And the Babylonian siege continues because sure enough, Pharaoh's army was crushed by the Babylonians. As the remaining Egyptians would flee, Nebuchadnezzar's forces returned their positions around the city to carry on the besiegement of Jerusalem. Months and months pass, and the hypothetical noose of uh, Nebuchadnezzar kind of closes in around Jerusalem. It's only going to tighten. we got people trapped inside the city, enduring, as we said earlier, starvation, sickness. There was a time of famine that would happen uh, during this. All while knowing outside the walls lay a certain annihilation. So they're just in a really, really increasingly hopeless situation. Zedekiah's uncertainty of where to go for help put Judah in an increasingly hopeless situation. He had put his trust in his advisors. He put his trust in Egypt and in Pharaoh. Uh, He only turned to God through Jeremiah when he felt he had no other options. The king could now find no one to deliver the Jews. His poor decisions had set the nation on the course toward God's judgment, and Babylon would be his instrument. Jeremiah 38, 4 through 5, says, And the official said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city. He's speaking of Jeremiah here, or these officials are speaking of Jeremiah. And the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of his people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Here we see that Zedekiah was unable to resist the evil words and the plans of others. Let's talk a little bit about the fate of Jeremiah and what he was doing during this whole time. Uh, in the mind of Zedekiah's advisors, Jeremiah had betrayed his nation. Jeremiah's proclamation of oncoming judgment had resulted in many Jews fleeing the city, and some would even defect to the Babylonians. Again, as we kind of read in that reading earlier, they were kind of urged to do this in a way. As the numbers of defenders dwindled, morale understandably began to drop. And during the battle between the Egyptians and the Babylonians, Jeremiah is seen trying to leave the city. And this is actually at God's behest. It wasn't a kind of a cowardly act here. He was urged to, to get some land and to, to go away. And so in the course of all these advisors seeing this happen, they have uh, Jeremiah, this prophet of God, imprisoned. Now we see the failure of Zedekiah, one of, one of many here. Zedekiah would send for Jeremiah, asking him privately for a word from the Lord, but Jeremiah remained firm in proclaiming Judah's forthcoming judgment. For a time, we see Jeremiah has shown some mercy. He's given rations and kept under guard, not in a dungeon or anything like that, but a courtyard. So this is a place where people are walking through, and he's kind of kept there under guard. Uh, Zedekiah's advisors, they hear that Jeremiah is continuing to warn anyone who listen about Jeremiah's coming destruction. And so they're, once again, infuriated. And they go to Zedekiah, demanding that Jeremiah be put to death as a malcontent bent on discouraging the remaining people. Here the cowardly king gave Jeremiah over to his enemies from that previous reading we had there in uh, Jeremiah 38, 4 through 5. He says, he's in your hand. The king of nothing can do, or the king can do nothing to oppose you. Uh, It's a really apathetic, a really weak-willed response. Uh, It kind of brings to mind the New Testament account of of Pilate, you know, giving in to the demands of the Jews calling for Christ to be crucified. At least that's what made me think of in, in reading that passage. Jeremiah is thrown into this thing called a cistern and slowly sinks into a mire of mud, uh, which is going to threaten to the prophet with an agonizing death by suffocation. 
And here we see the fickleness of Zedekiah. Uh, one of the few faithful men in the king's court, Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, told Zedekiah of Jeremiah's predicament. And the king reversed himself again and sent men to save this prophet. Following his rescue, Jeremiah was brought before Zedekiah for, for counsel once again. So here we have a glimmer of hope in the life of, of Zedekiah. At this point, he'd privately put some faith in God by summoning Jeremiah for counsel. He's at his most desperate point, perhaps. Uh, but Zedekiah had later demonstrated his weak will. Once again, as he yielded to the whims of his advisors, granting permission to have the prophet executed. So we see the king wavering between following God and following wicked men. Jeremiah 38, 17 through 18. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you'll surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given to the hand of the Chaldeans, and this shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. Here we see Zedekiah is given one last chance to submit to God's will at this really critical moment. First, we see Jeremiah's counsel as he comes before Zedekiah. He comes to him and tells him he's got this final, final opportunity to save himself, to save his family, and the city of Jerusalem. The prophet told the king that he, would, uh, he would, had this last opportunity, this last chance here, if only he'd admit defeat to Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah confided in Jeremiah, it seems like. He told him his fears, finally maybe realizing he could trust no one else. Think about Jeremiah, how he had compassion for this desperate man, speaking to him with hope, but also with stern honesty. The prophet implored the king, surrendered to the Babylonians according to God's will. Here we see that Zedekiah perhaps has a realization. He had to have known that Jeremiah was right. He surely should have known that no one else had been faithful to him this whole time, that no one else knew the truth or had spoken it to him, especially with courage as Jeremiah had. Zedekiah recognized that despite his awful treatment of Jeremiah, the prophet had always remained faithful to him as one who sought to serve his king, his God, and his country. But unfortunately, we also see Zedekiah's stubbornness. Despite this brief moment of clarity, Zedekiah just simply couldn't bring himself to obey God. One last time, we see Zedekiah reject Jeremiah's counsel to turn to the Lord. Jeremiah was sent away from the king's presence and put back into house arrest. Too long had Zedekiah made a habit of disobeying God. Too long had he valued the opinions of his advisors over the word of God brought to him by Jeremiah, and too great was the king's stubborn pride. So we see the ultimate fate of Zedekiah. Zedekiah, the king who willfully blinded himself to God's will, would wind up losing everything. Jeremiah 39, 4 through 7. When Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all his soldiers saw them, they fled going out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between two walls, and they went toward Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah, at the, hand, at the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. After this 30-month-long, 30 30-months, 30 30-month-long 30 siege of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city finally falls. There was a breach in the wall that allowed Babylonian soldiers to surge and pour into the city. The king and his advisors, we, as we just read, they attempted to save themselves through, I guess, a secret route and abandoned the people remaining in the city at this point, like a cowardly act here we see. The king's court, all those wicked men, false prophets, and others who had given Zedekiah such poor counsel time and time again, they were found and executed. Nebuchadnezzar's troops, we read elsewhere, would, would come in and destroy everything, including the temple, um, pillaging it, and all those things there. The king himself was captured and forced to watch his sons be brutally put to death, as we read, and finally he had to endure really awful torture of having his eyes gouged out. This kingdom of Judah would be dissolved, and many of its inhabitants were exiled, taken to Babylonian captivity, including the blinded and chained king Zedekiah. So what can we learn from Zedekiah? First, let's start by comparing our own character to that of this wicked king. We ask, are we unfaithful in our dealings with others? Are we uncertain of where to turn during hard times? Are we unable to resist temptation and do evil at the behest of others? Ultimately, are we unwilling to obey God? 
Consider that if this is the case, we will share in Zedekiah's fate, undone in the end, judged accordingly by the righteous God. Though our judgment not that they took on the same form of Jeremiah's, uh, it could be much worse. So this becomes the question, how can we avoid this fate? First thing we got to do is we've got to walk worthy of our calling. Think back to Zedekiah's given name, Mataniah. We mentioned uh, in kind of in passing as we went through this lesson here. Mataniah, which means the gift of God. However, through failing to heed God's word, he ended up causing great harm to befall his family, his nation, making his name a curse rather than a blessing it ought to have been. I'm paraphrasing Luke chapter 12, verse 48 here. To, to whom much is given, much is expected. Here's a guy that was given kingship, and what did he do with it? Despite this prophecy stating that Judah would eventually fall due to their sin, consider that Zedekiah himself was not destined to fail as a king. For Scripture tells us that all rulers are put in authority by God himself. Romans 13, 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist, that exist have been instituted by God. So Zedekiah, we see, was entrusted by God to do the right thing with his power. He most certainly could have used his authority and his position to positively affect his kingdom, but time and time again, he simply chose not to. And other times, he would just kind of be weak-willed about it. It's like, king can do nothing, uh, we read earlier. As Christians today, we bear the name of Christ himself. Unfortunately, there are too many who call themselves Christians that don't live up to the name of Jesus. Hypocritical behavior by Christians, uh, not acting in a Christ-like manner, consider that it turns many away from the world but becoming Christians themselves, and they don't bear the name of Christ themselves as a result. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 reminds us of what bearing the name of Christ is, is all about and just what, what we're given here in, in the course of this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may reclaim the excellencies of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called, the calling of you know, being a Christian, bearing the name of Christ. Another lesson we can learn is to not ignore the example of others. And I think that'd be a bad example or a good example. Zedekiah had the advantage of seeing both the rewards of the right example, think about his father, the good king Josiah, but also he saw the consequences of the wrong example. Think about his brothers that preceded him, his nephew, all these rebellious, wicked kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord. He saw their failures, again, trying to do what they did and turning against Babylon and turning against God and some of the other mistakes that they made along the way. Similarly, today, we're exposed to the example of others every day in our own lives. We can learn from the mistakes of those who made poor decisions, essentially learning what not to do. Uh, Proverbs 4, 14 through 17 tells us, do not enter the path of the wicked, do not walk on the way of the evil, avoid it, do not go into it, turn away from it and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they've done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they made someone stumble, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. On the other hand, we can also witness godly pattern of those who seek to follow Christ. If nothing else, we have the pattern of the saints that scripture describes for us, and of course we have the example of Jesus himself. 2 Timothy uh, 1 and 13 says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And 1 Peter 2, 21, For in this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may also follow his steps. Another point is to resist worldly influence. Unfortunately, we see Zedekiah chose to listen to worldly advisors, false prophets, and others that would deceive him rather than listen to God through Jeremiah. Zedekiah was repeatedly warned that what happened if he did not repent, but Zedekiah chose to ignore the warnings of Jeremiah because he feared those around him more than he feared God. That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Do we fail to heed the warnings found in God's word? Do we find ourselves being weak-willed when confronted with peer pressure? Uh, the, the, those around us, do we, do we kind of engage in activities we shouldn't be involved in? Do we fear men more than we fear God? We ourselves may fear persecution. Maybe it's from unbelievers or maybe even those that are unfaithful but we should strive to serve God above anyone else in the world. Matthew 10, 28, for some reason the verse didn't pop up there. There it is. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. In Acts 5, 29, the latter part of that verse reminds us that we must obey God rather than obey men. Final point we want to make here, another lesson we can learn from Zedekiah, is to not harden your heart from the Lord. We should repent. 
Zedekiah was given many chances to course correct his own life, to course correct his kingdom, and to turn to the Lord. Recognize that throughout Scripture, God is long suffering with sinners, allowing them many opportunities to turn to him. 2 Peter 3 14 through 16. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent, be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as our brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. So, you know, those of us that ask, you know, why does life continue to persist on this planet? You know, why are we still here? Uh, why, why does this continue to go on? Uh, every day that we're granted by God is another chance uh, for salvation, another chance for repentance. Recall that even up to the end, Zedekiah was given one more chance, yet another opportunity to repent and thereby be saved. So I urge you to not be like Zedekiah uh, and allow a chance after chance for the Lord's salvation to slip away. We need not harden our heart. We need to serve God today. A little bit lengthy reading. We're also going to skip around a little bit. Uh, if you'll turn over with me to Hebrews. I've just got a small part of that verse uh, part popping up there, this passage popping up there. Hebrews 4, and looking at verses uh, 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip on down to 6 through 7. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news has come to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not befit them or benefit them, because they were not unified, united by faith with those who listened. For you who have not believed entered the re that rest, as he said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Skipping on down to verse 6 and 7. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the heart, words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in favorable time, I have listened to you in a day of salvation. I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Maybe there's someone here this evening asking the question, appearing on the board at this time. What must I do to be saved? We hear the gospel of Christ, which admittedly we didn't say much about during the course of this, this lesson. We need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is everyone, everything He says that He is, our Savior, Redeemer, Messiah. We need to repent. Uh, just time and time again, that message was repeated through this lesson. Repent, repent, repent to Zedekiah. We need to repent and turn to God and give our will to Him. We confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before men. We be baptized for remission and forgiveness of sins. We continue to live faithfully. If we err from the faith, we repent once again. That message to repent comes again. We'll reiterate that verse once again, that latter part of verse 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If there's anyone that has any kind of spiritual need, we urge you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.